Okay, I think we can probably get started. Can everybody hear me all right? I'll try to lean in. I'm a little bit taller than the microphone, but uh, hopefully that's, that still works. How's everyone feeling? It's the last day. How's your energy? Is it like okay? Okay, <laughs> that's good to hear. Um, so my name, my name is Bjorn Thompson. I'm a solutions director at uh, ImageX, and to my right is John Tren, um, our, our CTO at, at ImageX. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the RFP process. Um, so we, at ImageX, we respond to a lot of RFPs. Maybe even we probably evaluate hundreds each year. Uh, we respond to to a whole lot of them, and um, you know, rather than being the author of RFPs, being the consumer of our RFPs, it often gives us um, you know some useful uh, insights and tips uh, about the process that um, you know can help in when you're planning um, to engage with a vendor and just trying to understand. Uh, what are some good ways that, um, that I can find the right partner for me, especially when you're in a process where you can't control everything. Um, an RFP is the very defi definition of that kind of process where there's many things that are um, already decided for you. So how can you make the best of a, si of, a, of a situation where you can't control everything? So we'll talk about that today. So um, as I said, my name is Bjorn. Uh, I work on the business development side of ImageX, so uh, we evaluate uh, projects, including many, many RFPs, and decide which ones to, to bid on. And uh, John? Yeah, so I'm John. I, I manage the dev team, obviously, but also I do a lot of uh, pre and post sales support and uh, pitching uh, from a vendor perspective, but also uh, over my career I've written and, and been on the evaluation side of, of many RFPs as well. So. Cool. Thanks, John. So um, we work with a lot of different groups that are um, bound by an RFP process, certainly higher education, nonprofit. And uh, a very common thing is that people are trying to get their, um, the quotes or their budget within $999,000 and 99 cents. Um, so you know, there's, there's often uh, a desire to kind of um, avoid or circumvent uh, an RFP process. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the ways that you can uh, maybe uh, either circumvent that process or um, alternately, uh, that you can kind of enhance um, that process if that's if that's the process that you're that you're going down. So, the first thing I wanted to talk about, really kind of briefly, were some of the challenges. And we don't want to paint a very dark picture of RFPs because there there are some some benefits to them, and we'll talk about those as well. But they can be like a bit of a blind date. Uh, they can accidentally rule out the ideal partner, and that's really the biggest um, kind of drawback is that uh, it's very common uh, for a vendor to to look at an RFP that actually might actually be a fit for them and to rule themselves out arbitrarily without realizing um, that it's not the right, the right fit for them. And we'll talk about how we can avoid that. It's also hard to know what to ask for. In a consultative process where you're talking to a vendor um, you know, in, a, in a kind of free form discovery process, um, they can ask you questions, you can ask them questions, uh, they can ask and probe, you know, what do you mean by migration? Or what do you mean by uh, integration with Salesforce? But when you're sort of sending a written document into the ether, uh, th there's often not, not a chance to ask those kinds of questions, except for a, like a written Q&A, which is a bit like sort of playing checkers by mail. Um, the other thing is they can encourage an adversarial relationship. You know, RFPs tend to be a fairly compliance-heavy document. Um, so, you know, they can cause people to like uh, overestimate things because they, they, they worry about uh, uh, accounting for uh, the budget for, for, for an integration or something like that. So they put in 100 hours when it's actually a five-hour piece. That, that sort of thing. And this, in general, they're prone to, to misunderstanding. So the reason that's a problem is, um, you know, it takes a long time to create an RFP. It takes a long time to get there as an organization. And when you start off on the wrong foot, it's really dispiriting. Um, we see a lot of RFPs that get retracted and reissued several months later, uh, which can lead to an even longer delay. Like, especially coming out of COVID, people don't want to wait <laughs> to do their project. They really want to get going, and they don't want to lose that organizational energy. Um, so having an RFP that isn't very um, effective or, or, or isn't structured effectively um, can really kind of lead to um, longer delays and confusion both on, on both sides about for the vendor, you know, what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? Um, what's the sort of business case that you're trying to present? And then the last piece is a poor, a re an RFP that is not written effectively um, can really lose sight of why you're doing it in the first place. Uh, and, and you kind of get caught up in legalese um, and, uh, you know, sort of terms and conditions instead of the actual goal of the project and the business value of the project. So there is a better way, and I'm not going to uh, try to, hopefully I won't try to pretend in this that I have the solution to everything or we have the solution to everything, but we'll talk about some things that I think have, that, that have value to discuss. If you are required to, to follow a process of procuring a vendor, a lot of people are, and that there's a lot of value in that. 
uh, there are still a lot of things you can do to make sure that you have a successful uh, project. So we're going to kind of focus on four, four main areas, uh, how to create a great sort of partner-driven RFP. And what we mean by that is like a collaboration. Uh, most people are seeking a partnership with somebody who has a long-term orientation, who, who knows you, who gets you. Um, so some of the things that, that kind of help you achieve that include doing your homework, and we'll talk a bit about that, structuring the RFP. So there's things you can do within the RFP document, knowing that it's a limited format, it's not a conversation, it's a document, uh, that can help you attract the right partner. So if, it's, if an RFP is like a blind date, at least we can write a good profile uh, for our blind date. Uh, avoiding typical RFP traps, and we'll talk about some of those are, and having um, a well-defined selection process. And that, that's important too. We don't want to just talk about the document, we want to talk about what happens afterwards. Yeah, is there anything else that you want to add, John, that haven't? Uh... Um, no, I think, I mean, we've got some more points on how to do a good RFP, but I mean, on the advantages side, I think, uh, you know, there are some advantages to RFPs, mm -hmm. they have kind of a negative connotation, but the most, the biggest one from a, a, a procurement perspective is price, pricing discovery, getting competitive bids, you know, and, but um, I think there's a little bit too much emphasis sometimes on mm -hmm. the pricing. I think uh, the, the more important thing is that some things cost more or less than you think, um, and spelling that out in RFP can give you like a broad perspective on, on uh, you know, varied opinions on that. And then also, you know, you can really optimize your kind of procurement workflow, um, you know, working with just not just the people that, uh, that are looking for, for the solution, but also, you know, dealing with legal and, mm -hmm. and procurement and working all those kinks out so that uh, you can get started sooner than later. Like the, we've, we've won RFPs and then you, they're, they're willing to start right away, but then you know, the project's delayed for like six months because of legal or, or procurement issues. Um, so doing it properly can really help mm -hmm. uh, cut through that. So. Yeah, that pre-work is so, so important. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that as well as like how, how you can engage with, you know, engage in a way that gets you off to, a, to the right start and a kickstart rather than having to wait for three months to even get the RFP document out. Um, so before we start, so we'll talk about all those elements. We'll just, we'll, we'll talk about a couple things you can do to tweak the RFP process. You may not be able to do all of these or any of them, but um, if you can, they're, they are obviously quite valuable. Um, for some organizations, uh, some, some ways that they can modify the process include a closed or semi-closed RP process, maybe inviting select bidders that you know. Uh, you've done a bit of diligence, uh, you've looked on you know, Clutch or Drupal.org or whatever it might be, and you found some, some bidders that you already feel are fit. And just, just letting them know this RP exists and, and to bid on it. Another thing that if, if you are allowed to um, is very helpful is offering individual calls um, written documents are very difficult to interpret um, uh, requirements from. Uh, the ability to talk to people a little bit beforehand is very, very valuable. If you don't have the ability to offer that, and there's often, um, you know, RPs are intended to be objective. That's the whole sort of purpose of them. Uh, so, you know, eliminating subje subjective bias by reducing the amount of, like, advantages ahead of time is very common. Is just thinking about structuring the pre-conference or the pre-call bid. Um, I don't, has anyone here ever attended a pre-conference bid. Have you ever, I don't know if you've, if this was the format that you experienced, but it's very commonly like someone will open up the RFP and like literally read it from like top to bottom. It's not particularly enlightening to, to a vendor. Um, so if you structure it more like a Q&A um, and more, more focus the um, whatever opportunities you have prior to the RFP, uh, structure it more like uh, explaining your business case, explaining what you're trying to do, uh, talk, talk less about Compliance and require and compliance and procurement, and more about um, you know what are you what are you looking for? What kind of partner are you looking for? Um, what what kind of success outcomes are you are you seeking? You know that's that's actually maybe the only opportunity a lot of folks have to actually put their business case forward. So, when you are sort of involved in that uh, RP process, there there's a number of things you can do to prepare in advance to make it successful. This was actually my former boss. Um, said in a consensus-based organization, 17 against one is considered a tie. And I think that's something we all know from, from the organizations we work with, is that you know, getting alignment is always a, is always a really, really important um, element to, to a successful project. There's a couple other really, really critical things. One is assigning a, assigning a really strong project lead. Like an RFP is a project, <laughs> and finding somebody who really um, can articulate your business case and pull the stakeholders together is so, so important. Um, getting alignment with the stakeholders is obviously super, uh, super important. And 
you know, this, the, that project itself of, of creating the RFP is, is a discovery process. Uh, so, you know, the ability to send out um, you know, surveys to get people together, maybe even in discovery workshops of some sort to, um, to understand in advance, um, you know, what, what we're trying to build, very, very helpful. And setting clear expectations, I'll talk about that one in a minute. And then finally, this is kind of like a subtle one, but it's very important, is when an RFP isn't like written well as a business document, it's very difficult to respond to. Uh, it's extremely valuable in an organization to assign somebody who understands the rules of, of business writing and can write a strong business case uh, to, do, to, do, to do the RFP. The RFP is not like a wish list of um, things you want. It's a punchy, concise narrative of what you're trying to achieve as an organization. So if you can get people on the project or yourself um, kind of be very familiar with, with what makes a strong business case. I mean, I mean, the way the RFP you're trying to sell to the partner that you're, that you're trying to reach. So you want it to be not just about what you need, but about um, you know, helping them understand who you are and what you're trying to achieve. The second thing about getting alignment is, you know, it's a very common thing. I don't know if you've ever read an RFP or if you read hundreds of them a year like, like uh, we do in our, in our time. But it's, it's often the case we'll see like 30 or 40 different requirements, but have very little insight into which ones are important. So kind of helping the vendors understand from your wish list what the priorities are is so important. And that, help, that serves you so much um, because, you know, if they're looking at 30 things they need to respond to, they don't know which ones to invest in more. Um, they don't know which ones um, are going to matter to you more. If they know that these are our top three things or our top five things, then they're going to invest more time in that and you're going to get a better overall solution. The other element is just setting expectations, helping your internal stakeholders understand the big picture. The earlier, earlier you can sell the idea that not everybody is going to get every single thing that they want, um, but it's going to be vastly better. So looking at the, the overall goal and the big picture, the better. And then secondly, something that sometimes gets neglected is there's more than one way to get there. When you get you know, 20 responses or 15 responses, there's going to be a lot of different solutions uh, and to be open to them and not to try to pre-solve during the, the RP process and tell vendors what you need. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, not solutioning in the RFP is, is really yeah. critical because often we'll, we'll see a, an RFP and they've already like picked technologies and uh, you know, started to recommend uh, approaches to, to execution, which um, you know, I can see why people want to do that. They want a very specific uh, response and, and quote to, to what they're, thinking ahead of, but uh, you know, if you're, when you're going out to a collection of, of solution providers, you need to give them some freedom to recommend and uh, provide expertise. And if it's too, too prescriptive, uh, you, know, you, you, should, you might be better off just um, sourcing people to do it yourself instead of um, going to a partner. So uh, yeah, it's important not to solution too much, otherwise you, you're maybe using the wrong approach. Yeah, totally agree, John. We'll talk about that a bit, about some specific traps to avoid when you're trying to, try to pre-solution. So I guess that brings us kind of a big part of, of what we want to talk about today is it's easy to talk in principle about um, you know, being collaborative, planning ahead, doing, doing things well, but what does that actually look like in practice? Um, so there are some specific, specific things that we regularly see that we classify as do's and don'ts of, of RFPs. And of course, this is just our take, take on it. Feel free to disagree. Um, but uh, you know, some of the things that we, th we think are very, very valuable and lead to better outcomes and better partnerships are setting high-level goals. Um, so understanding you know, what is the purpose of, of, this, um, of this project, helping the vendor understand you know, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, and uh, you know, what, at, the, at a high level, what is this project? Sometimes in an RFP, perhaps you've read one, you might get to literally page 41 or 83 and still not know what this project is. So that's very, very important. Uh, distinguishing between must-haves and nice-to-haves, uh, very, very critical, we'll talk about that. And being clear and realistic about, about time and budget. Um, because of the written nature of RFPs, it's often a dance, right? You're, you're worried about giving away your budget, uh, and maybe if you say my budget is 300,000, then you'll get a bunch of responses with a budget of 299,999. Um, but we'll talk about some of the ways that you can, you can communicate your ranges without giving away the, the store. And then like John talked about, avoiding solutions. And, uh, and finally, we'll talk about being specific about integrations. And integrations could stand in for anything that's complex in nature. And we'll talk about what, what we mean by that. So 
I mean, the first thing, it may sound obvious, but it's, it's missed so often, is just writing a clear business case. And that's obviously where good business writing comes in. Uh, so if the goal is attracting more prospective students, helping us understand what the must-haves are, so an up-to-date up -to design, uh, good program pages, easy to use navigation. I'm using a hybrid example, but it could be anything. Um, and then defining nice-to-haves. Interactive campus map may not be the number one thing that students care about. Uh, ERP integration may help with that, but it's, it may be something further down, down the road, a roadmap piece. So just helping people understand, here's the goal, here's the elements of execution that we think we need, um, and then here's some things that we think might be useful over time. Aside from like the business case, another thing that gets talked about a lot and people are kind of almost nervous about is how, how much should I say about budget? How much should I say about time? How can I structure that in a way that's useful? So just because of the nature of RFPs, they don't really let you learn a whole lot about what, a, what the right budget should be or what the right timeline should be. Um, so the way that you ask vendors for budget and timeline can really help you uh, understand, understand better. Um, and uh, you know, it can, it's very, very helpful if you can give them a little bit of flexibility, kind of like we talk about what John talked about the solution, because cost and time is also part of the solution. So um, rather than telling them, you know, this is the timeline, although that, that is an option at, at times that you can, you can do, especially if the timeline is a little bit more flexible in nature. If, you, if right now it's, um, you know, April 2022, if you say, we'd like to launch before April 2023, that's probably enough time to do something and to give people enough flexibility. Uh, alternately, um, if you say the goal is to launch in June 2022, you're probably going to have fewer responses by, by the nature of that, uh, that unrealistic timeline. So asking for timeline as a range is very helpful and giving people a little bit of guidance about budget. Um, if you don't people give people any guidance about budget, the likelihood that you're going to get a lot of irrelevant responses or a range between 20,000 and 400,000 is just so high. So if you can say, for example, we can't exceed this amount or even a very broad range, like 150,000 to 400,000, is so valuable for people so that the vendor who wants to work with you won't just opt out. We, we opt out all the time because we don't know, um, from reading the RP, we don't know how, what kind of budget people have and uh, and what, what their tolerance might be for that. Yeah, it just comes back to priorities. So if you're, if budget, if you have a f very fixed budget and uh, you don't tell people that, you might get you know, a bunch of quotes that are double yeah. what you, you could possibly spend. So it's a waste of everyone's time. Or if you need it delivered in four months and a vendor can't start for three months because of resource constraints, there's really no point. They should withdraw and you should let them know um, enough for them to withdraw on time and not waste your time reviewing you know, a proposal that doesn't make sense. But uh, so yeah, so you know, kind of golden triangle constraints there, um, but help, helping set clear um, priorities for your vendors and for yourself is uh, really helpful. Yeah, that's one of the most common sources of, of like RFP reissues and retractions is people you know, put, put it out there and then they get bids double what they, what they were hoping for. Um, and it's kind of this, this really, really uh, unproductive process. And then the final piece is, um, you know, RPs are often fixed bid. That's often just the nature, nature of them. Uh, but if we can, if, if it's possible to avoid, um, you know, fixed bid to give people a little bit of sense of, of what your budget range is, uh, but be open to their, their budgeting approach, uh, I think that's ex extremely valuable. The other thing, and John, you kind of already talked about this, is presenting vendors with problems, not solutions. There's like fingernails on a chalkboard for a vendor, honestly. <laughs> when we see something has, has already told us what we're building, uh, it doesn't give, the vendors you want have imagination and curiosity and passion, uh, and that's not gonna attract that kind of vendor. Um, so the things that um, are helpful to vendors is to say, okay, the content needs to be user focused, navigation needs to be clear, um, walk us through your discovery process, help us understand how you work with us. What's not helpful are things like, uh, the key pages need a flexible slider, and then no explanation of why, just you know, they need a flexible slider. Uh, we need a mega menu. Okay, we need a mega menu. Uh, or sort of uh, a common thing that is, seems like it, it adds precision but actually adds fuzziness is, you know, we see a lot like RFPs, we will have a, uh, a phase in the project called strategy that will go from March 3rd to, um, you know, May, May 7th. That just makes it so difficult for the vendor to respond because they have their own process that's probably quite effective. It's been refined over years. Um, so the more that you don't prescribe how they do it, but tell them what, what the goal is, the better the result's gonna be. I guess the last piece about sort of do's and don'ts is 
is about being specific about requirements. Um, every vendor who's ever responded to an RFP, uh, or if anyone who's ever responded to an RFP knows what I'm talking about, is you see a section called integrations. There's always a section called uh, integrations or, or systems or whatever it's called. And then you'll see like it's about this long, and it says Salesforce, ERP integration, SAS system. And you wonder, what am I supposed to build? Um, and uh, th those, those are the sorts of um, th that kind of putting a little meat on the bones of what people are building is so valuable. Or if you're not sure and you, and you say, we know we need a Salesforce integration, we're not sure yet, uh, as much information as you can give the vendor uh, about uh, the nature of these complex technical pieces, ERP diagrams, whatever you can do to help them understand um, is going to m lead to far better responses. So just, just some you know, rough examples of things that are likely to get better responses are our Salesforce system will, will pull three required fields for display in a list of programs. Uh, the list must update hourly to make sure that new programs are displayed in a timely way. If you can start to spec out the business requirements and create them as kind of user stories, it's so valuable. Even if they change, it gives people a proxy of what kind of complexity they're dealing with. Are we the right organization to respond to this or not? Um, so, you know, I guess one of the key points of structuring the RFP is if you can think of it like the kinds of things that uh, a vendor needs to know what kind of thing you'd want to know. <laughs> if you read that, would you understand it? Um, and helping them, helping them along the way, they don't have the internal knowledge. Um, so if you can give them a little bit of insight into what, what, uh, what you need, uh, very, very valuable. So the last piece we want to talk about is we've talked about like constructing a technical document. Uh, and there's a lot of work and thought that goes into that. But then you get all these responses. Uh, and we'll, I, we're going to provide a little bit of thought th that we have about um, some effective ways of, of scoring uh, and following up. So one of the key things is just making sure that you're scoring things that, that actually matter. Um, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. But, you know, this is going to be a little bit of probably common sense, but I think it's important to say is some indicators of a strong proposal, things that, you know, you're looking for and, uh, and show, show you that the, the vendor actually cares about your problem and, and is grappling with it in a, in, a, in a kind of profound way is, you know, customized responses, uh, a, a huge indicator of, of, of something that is, um, you know, where it's not just like an intern sort of slapping together and cutting and pasting uh, elements from previous proposals. A clear understanding of your problem. It's very useful in an in RP if you can, if one of the questions is, could you summarize your understanding of our problem in a, in a, in a brief or concise way? That, that's often very telling about whether they actually understand what they're building. Also, if a vendor is willing to challenge assumptions, uh, and that's something that's very good to say in an RFP, tell us what we don't know or tell us if we're doing it the right way. Also, if a vendor provides alternate approaches, they might say, you know, yes, we could do it this way, but here's another way that we also think could work uh, that you might want to consider. And then finally, a vendor who provides concise, clear themes, and that's where you can really help them. If you have 40 things that you want and you help them focus on five, that helps them to kind of develop like a narrative for the, for the, for the, for the response and it help, um, helps them understand, okay, they care a lot about accessibility, uh, you know, they, they care a lot about content governance. We can develop some themes around that. And then of course, selecting finalists. Um, there's always gonna be a mix of, of gut and science with, with selecting finalists and uh, we won't presume to tell you because I feel like we're, we're biased in, of course, uh, selecting, selecting finalists as, as an agency. But um, it's very useful to have a scoring model and to have a clear scoring model that you put in the RFP, make it very straightforward, and hopefully make it match the structure of the RFP and what you're asking for. Um, but also talking about gut, you know, you, there is a, um, if we only depend on score, and we never talk about, you know, the, the sort of overall gestalt of the, of the proposal, I think we're kind of, kind of missing something, getting too deep, deeply into the weeds. It's obviously very helpful, this is probably common sense, but sorting things into uh, no's, maybe's, and, and yeses, and, and, and the maybe's might actually prove themselves over time if you give them a, if you give them a chance. So for maybe's and yeses, uh, asking follow-up questions is extremely valuable. If you're permitted to have a follow-up call, that's even more valuable. Uh, but any way that you can kind of help um, help them succeed. Maybe there are some areas where they didn't really understand what you're asking for, um, or they, you know, even potentially didn't have didn't have time to to respond to that in, in the depth that they that they could. Uh, very very helpful. Not every team that has an amazing design team and an amazing development team has the time to respond to your proposal well. So uh, sometimes you, giving them a second crack at it is very helpful. 
uh, winnowing the group, the group down to a manageable number, and then setting up a clear work back schedule for when you're going to have finals presentations, how long you're going to take to uh, evaluate them, uh, and, and all those elements. And that, that brings me to the last one. Before we did, John, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that? I'm good. You're good for now? Okay. So this is something that is true, and we all know it from our own work lives, whatever we do, is that not everybody's good at everything. Often people who have a very slick uh, pitch and, and, and are beautiful presenters aren't always the best fit for, for your team, not to say that they wouldn't be, but a finalist presentation isn't always the best showcase <laughs> for, for the, the vendor that you want. So how do you find a, a partner within that kind of artificial format of a final, finalist presentation? So some of the key things include like making it a conversation. It's very common in finalist presentations, we see a list of like 13 questions that we want, people want us to respond to, often in 20 to 25 minutes. It's not really a chance to get to know what it's like to work with that person. Um, so making it more open and more flexible is very valuable. Keeping the agenda flexible, instead of peppering it with every wish list item that you want, think about something like share a, share a case study with us. Um, tell us what you think we should do on this project, maybe in, in three areas. Uh, here's a problem that we have. Uh, how, how can we solve this problem? The other elements of evaluating the finalist presentation are making it as much about Q&A as possible. Often the presentation is not that revealing, but the Q&A is very revealing. Um, so if you uh, weight the time of the presentation more toward the Q&A, you'll often get a lot more value uh, out of it. And then finally, like, you know, in a final presentation, because of the nature of the RFP process where people are trying to keep things objective and non-biased, it's common that people will almost have a very kind of like cold demeanor in, the, in these presentations. But in the end of the day, you're looking for somebody you want to work with for years. Uh, you want to be able to get to know what, what it's like to talk to them, what it's like to work. Can you work with these people? So trying to establish rapport, a little bit of small talk at the beginning, uh, asking questions, making people feel comfortable. A lot of the people, and part of that secret is, a lot of people you're talking to in the finals presentation, they aren't professional presenters. You know, they're developers or designers, and uh, you know, if you make them feel a little bit comfortable, you're much more likely to get a better response. And then I guess the last thing we want to talk about is, um, once you get through the, that, that, that process of evaluation, scoring, and, and such, negotiating, um, and negotiating with vendors. So this is a really important one because doing this um, inefficiently can tie you up in, in really, really long process in, of legal wrangling. Some of the ways that you can shorten that process, it's never possible to do it as short as you want, <laughs> but include taking a collaborative approach, maybe walking through the SOW and MSA together with, with, your, with your vendor uh, and understanding, you know, helping them understand what some of the pitfalls are Helping them understand, we think legals can care about this, or um, maybe even asking them, could you please share your documents early so I can start to share them internally and get that process going. Um, the other thing is trusting that your partner is acting in good faith, trusting that you've made a good call, um, and trying to treat it as non-adversarially as possible. So if the partner has an alternate way to capture a requirement that they are suggesting, um, you know, just being open to that, being, being open to the, the fact that they've done this a lot of times, and that they may actually have some, a valid way to approach this in a different way. And that brings us to the last point is, you know, asking the partner's advice, um, not to say that you're blindly trusting them, but um, you know, we, a lot of times vendors have been through this before and they can help guide you through the procurement process in a way that, well, you might have only done it once or twice and maybe they've done it one or 200 times. So there's a lot of value in, in getting some input from the vendor. Don't be afraid to ask, ask for that. As a, as a vendor, I have a funny story for you. So recently, we won a, a Drupal uh, RFP, and of course, the, uh, the client wanted to get started right away, and we start uh, negotiating the contract, and the, one of the first terms we notice in the uh, legal contract is no open source software. So uh, that kind of put a quick stop <laughs> to the project. Um, so we, you know, we just, uh, to, we're not actually weren't that surprised. We've seen it a couple times, uh, and uh, we worked with their legal team. Um, you know, got uh, we didn't even really have to get our lawyers involved. It was more of an educational um, exercise to, to to show them. You know, the, obviously the the conflicting uh, items there, and then we worked through it with them, and we got stuff cleared up pretty quick. But uh, yeah, crazy things like that, you know, happen uh, quite regularly. Yeah, it's. Um it's a very common thing that you have certain institutional requirements that you have to solve for. Like, for example, it's very common that people have milestone-based billing. Like, we won't pay until the design phase is finished or something along those lines. 
and asking your vendor to kind of help you solve that, um, very, very valuable. You know, not even being afraid of like collaborating on, on in, in sort of pre-discovery meetings, uh, sharing Google Docs in order to kind of um, get, get, get a collaborative approach going earlier in the process rather than sending documents back and forth, which is very time consuming and very uh, mistake prone. So that's, that's the summary of, of our presentation. So I guess like the key point that uh, we want to make about the RP process is, you know, it can put a kind of pit of nervousness or fear in people's stomach that they feel like they're, they're concerned that the RP process is gonna overtake the project that they're not gonna find the right people uh, and that um, they're gonna get such a different range of solutions that they're not gonna even know the way forward. But there are a lot of things that we can do um, early in the process, in the RFP, in the finals presentation and afterwards to kind of help, help the vendor succeed, uh, give them the, the impression that they need to be successful and also signal to the vendor that we're a together organization um, that you're going to want to work with. <laughs> you know, all these things are, like an RFP document is a marketing document. You want, you want to find somebody who wants you and likes you and, and wants to work on your project. So the more you make it easier for them, the more likely you are to find the vendor that's a, a fit for you for the long term. Thank you. Questions? Hi. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Great. Um, so I've met a lot of really great agencies here this week um, and had some great talks, some less great talks, but I definitely had sort of more candidates than, uh, than I want. <laughs> Yeah. Um, even to distribute an RFP to. Um, and a lot of times when you start having these conversations, even informally with the vendor, their response is, well, we want to do a discovery phase. And we can of course. do that as an individual, yeah. you know, paid engagement, smaller, and then that would help bulk out, you know, mm -hmm. your details. Like, I don't know if I could give the details of, you know, what APIs I want. Yeah. Nor, do, nor do I think that it would be appropriate to include that in an RFP. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, the, the, the level of detail that's necessary to kind of choose your dance partner before, you know, I don't want, I don't want to do discovery with five firms. Exhausting. Before. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I want to do discovery once, and yeah. hopefully that goes really well, and it, it leads to the rest of the engagement. Yeah, this is where the, there's a productive discussion about, like, you know, the, like, Sort of who, who, who holds the cards, who's in the catbird seat. Um, so five discoveries is, is too much. I couldn't imagine doing that. I just attended four days of a conference and I'm exhausted. Um, I, there is, the, though, value if, you're, if your process allows it. I don't know if you're locked into any specific way of doing things or not. Um, if you can have at least some form of shorter call with each of those, of those vendors, Usually within an hour, um, you'll be able to explain enough, they'll be able to ask enough so that you have gotten value on both sides. And even if out of that process, you don't, um, you don't end up liking that vendor's approach, you've, you probably will have learned something. Uh, and, the, and you probably will have helped them understand whether the project is a fit. So it's, it's just in the vendor's best interest um, to suggest a paid discovery process, um, maybe even sometimes an unpaid discovery process, but certainly a paid one, uh, that uh, kind of helps them understand your problem. But it's, in a competitive bid scenario, that's very not practical uh, for, for most groups. Uh, so the ability to have a shorter uh, process where at least you have a chance to talk to them is, is definitely valuable. Um, did I, I guess the question is, did I answer your question in full? Okay, was there another part to that? Not really, I mean, I'm happy to have the informal yeah. conversation. Gotcha. RFP process, I'm, I'm happy that talking through, it's just, it's the narrowing process and also, yeah. um, I mean, it, going on, you know, their experience, your gut, et cetera, yeah. maybe, maybe geographical proximity, but maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe. No, I, I understand why, yeah, yeah. That, that seems like that's a large road to go down. 
when you start a conversation, that seems like less of an investment on both sides and more likely to start to get a little bit of a sense of a match. Yeah. And I, think I would suggest you um, think about your own priorities. And just what you're saying today exactly. suggests a little bit of what you're looking for, which is uh, not a, a bunch of you know, initial discoveries. You want to figure out kind of maybe the working relationship first yeah. and then uh, the discovery would be part of the project, but you know you don't want to do a lot of initial kind of pre-selection stuff. So finding an agency that works uh, well in that model is, is, is one way to exclude uh, or select. So you want the RFP that has enough information in it. Yes. Without doing a discovery, but it's still a useful process. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And some agencies are happy to do that. Other other ones want to do the discovery before even respond to the RFP and that, that will help you select or, or you know, shortlist. Um, yeah. Can I just add one piece to that? We've done that, we've had two situations in the we've sometimes engaged with um, Google vendors as well in Australia, and we've done a discovery at a discrete phase, mm -hmm. and then the client can then own that. It's not costed, it's just make sure that work is done, and then they can take that out to market if they're not happy with yep. where, where they are, get a fair shake of opinion, and they can get a bonus of cost as well. So that's kind of taken care of, but you're not locked into the full RFI, sure. No one may pay you to fly, so you have to have to one right to make sure you the way. But you do that first, that sort of, you know, kind of get a feel from that, and that gives you the top four or five, and maybe you don't have one hour conversation with it. And just give you some of these other RFPs. So you don't have to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great approach. Any UI or. I was going to suggest that as well. Yeah. And you basically you get kind of generic information about the agencies, but a little more depth than you would, you know, in a, a, a conversation, um, you know, at a conference, right? So. Yeah, the great thing about you know, about expression of interest or RFI as well is, more vendors are willing to to respond to them than to an RFP, which may not fit into their into their schedule. So if it's an eight page or six page document, they're much more likely to to uh, to be able to to respond to it in the time frame. Yeah, that's a great question. So I might, maybe I can even throw it over to Rosie, who hates to be put on the spot in the back here. So we have a, we have a formal evaluation process um, that, we, that we go through. Uh, we have several, it's a little bit like scoring, it's like a little bit on the other side, how the, how the prospect would score the, the responses. We do, we do have an RFP scoring model. Um, it includes like several criteria, like um, you know, uh, sector fit, um, or obviously like budget, time, th those sorts of things. Um, and uh, that helps us a lot. Um, and uh, we also have regular kind of RFP like scrums where we talk through like all the, all the things we could be doing, which one's a fit, which one's not. And the other important element of that is, this is kind of a subtle one, but it's important is when we're, as a vendor evaluating an RFP, we're also trying to evaluate, will this, will this project carry our organization forward toward our goals? Like, is it a big project? Is it a project where the sector we want to be in? Um, and what's obviously then also evaluating the winnability. Do we think that uh, by investing 20 or 30 hours in this, uh, we are likely to win it or is this just, or very legitimately, maybe it's not highly winnable, but uh, maybe it brings us into a sector we, we really want to get into. Thank you. Oh. Okay, cool. So you're here, you're at DrupalCon the last day Maybe even in your last session, no one will get upset with you if you go back to your hotel and have a nap, I don't think. Uh, but thank you so much for joining the session.